190th episode of the Atlas Society Asks. My name is Jennifer Anju Grossman. My friends call me JAG. I'm the CEO of the Atlas Society. We are the leading nonprofit introducing young people to the ideas of Ayn Rand in fun, creative ways, graphic novels, uh, animated videos, music videos. Uh, today, we are joined by Roger Simon. Before I even begin to introduce our guest, I really want to remind all of you, this is important. Uh, if you're watching us on Zoom, Instagram, Twitter, X, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, use the comment section. Uh, we're going to be talking about American refugees. And um, so especially if you have just moved out of an oppressive state, you're thinking of making a move, uh, this is going to be a really fun forum to, to talk about some of those questions you may have. Our guest today, Roger Simon, has had quite the storied career, uh, an a Academy Award nominated screenwriter, mystery novelist. This was before becoming CEO and co-founder uh, of the pioneering blog, news and opinion website, PJ Media. Uh, as a novelist, he received acclaim for his Moses Wine detective series. Um, and his nonfiction books include Turning Right at uh, Hollywood and Vine, The Perils of Coming Out Conservative in Tinseltown. And I know best how moral narcissism is destroying our republic if it hasn't already. He joins us to discuss his latest book, American Refugees, The Untold Story of the Mass Exodus from Blue States to Red States. Roger, thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me. It sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun. The uh, uh, I would say one thing to your introduction, or one, one gloss, not just people who have made the move from blue states to red states, but I think the book is going to be interesting to people who are contemplating such a move. I, I didn't write it intentionally as a consumer report, quote unquote, but I I realized halfway through that people will use it that way, and I think they should. I mean, because it's an experiential book about what it felt like to move, and it, uh, it talks mostly about Tennessee, talks also about other red states uh, where I have been and talked to people in, uh, principally Florida, uh, Arizona, Texas, and Georgia. I, I, I would put a, a blinking yellow light on Georgia. <laughs> for many for many reasons and it's it's a very personal book and and uh, you bring up a lot of these issues through the lens of you know gosh concerns about health care if I'm going from New York or California uh where I know my experts and I'm going to a totally new state so um and I there are a lot of Atlas Society donors and trustees who've who've made those moves um and others who are contemplating it. So uh, I think we're going to have a great discussion. Before we even get into that, um, we'd love to begin with our guests' origin stories. So uh, where were you born? What kind of family you grew up in? And um, what originally inspired you to get into the movie business? <laughs> okay, well, here's... Uh, I grew up... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, upper middle class New, New York City Jewish boy whose father was a doctor at Mount Sinai Hospital on Fifth Avenue, and we grew. I grew up in the in the in the building right next door to uh, to that hospital, and it, it was kind of weirdly fortuitous because we were on the second floor. It was a sixteen floor. Most of those buildings were around sixteen stories, and at that point in Manhattan history. And I would look up uh, it, at a window about, I guess, on the 10th floor of the building right across the street. And every day I would see a man wearing a sports jacket sitting at a, at a typewriter, just typing away for hours on end. And where, where to me, my father was never home because he was a doctor, you know. So <laughs> he was like at the hospital from uh, four in the morning to four at night, you know, which is like. Yeah, my, my dad's a cardiologist. The younger well. doctor, you know, they're, they're slaves to the work. And, and all his friends were doctors. So therefore, I did, I, the only adult 
other than my mother that I ever saw was this man at the window. And I couldn't figure out, who, he, what is this guy doing? Is that work? And then finally, I said to my mother, who is that guy up on the 10th floor? And she said, don't you know who that is? That's Herman Wook. Oh, my goodness. Wow. And, uh, you know, and I actually, interestingly enough, the first adult book that I ever read was The Cain Mutiny, which was written by Herman Wook. He, he also wrote quite a number of well-known books and was yeah. actually also in the Jewish world well-known, although I didn't know that at the time. For writing uh, books about that, and and then also then he wrote Mar Marjorie Morning, so blah blah. blah. Yeah. But anyway, that uh, that was my also my parents. Although you know, uh, my mother was a housewife, my father was a a doctor who was actually involved in the Manhattan Project, and he. So I was around physicists a lot when I was little. I mean, yeah, I I didn't know at the time that the, a movie would be made about him, but I am told, and I cannot remember it, that I was introduced to J. Robert Oppenheimer when I was three. Wow. I have, I have no memory of this. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, anyway, uh, <clears throat> I, I my father wanted me to be a doctor, but he was so brilliant at all this stuff. Obviously, in the Manhattan Project, he treated the Hiroshima ladies because he was a radiologist. I realized I was totally outclassed in that. <laughs> so I went off in another direction. But he 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 was uh he was um still determined that I would be a doctor. And uh, <laughs> so so when I told him at the age of 15 I wanted to be a writer, he said, Well, he said, why not still be a doctor? I mean, Chekhov was a doctor. And I'm thinking, Chekhov? I mean, never in my wildest imagination. To this day, could I ever be Chekhov? I mean, I mean, that's like saying, oh, you know, uh, the Superman was the, or something, you know, it, it was like ridiculous. I mean, I already knew that Chekhov was the greatest playwright since Shakespeare. It's uh, probably easily that. So I, 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 I'm going, oh, leave me alone. <laughs> anyway, uh but I always, you know, wanted to be a writer either. And then pretty soon, because of the time I grew up, uh, I wanted to be a writer, director of movies. I failed at the director part. I, I've done it, but I failed at it. And I, the reason I failed at it, I know now, was I was so taken with the idea of the director that... Oh. Uh, I the, 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 I thought the director like Fellini or someone like that did it all on the set. <laughs> that you, you know, if your script wasn't there, it didn't matter because you were the maestro. So when I wrote scripts for other people, I made sure it was there. When I did it for myself, I think I can do this later. <laughs> no. <laughs> wow. no. Wow. Anyway, and, and then later on, I met people like Paul Mazursky and Woody Allen. And, they say, and I told them that story. They said, were you crazy? <laughs> because the old Hollywood thing was, if it ain't on the page, it ain't on the stage. It's right. Well, it's, you have a... The secret you, of the whole thing is about the writing, not about the directing. Um, the directing is the claim and the girls. So it's interesting, as I mentioned at the top, uh, Atlas Society obviously uh, directed, uh, is it's geared towards engaging young people with the ideas of Ayn Rand, who herself had her beginning in the movie industry. Uh, that early meeting with Cecil D. DeMille ended up working in wardrobe, and then as an extra, eventually reading scripts, then, then writing scripts, um, and, uh, and, and writing screenplays, uh, many of, of which were, were um, produced. Uh, you have read Ayn Rand, any thoughts on her literature or, or nonfiction? The two of you also went from fiction to going on to nonfiction. Yeah, well, I, you know, I think Ayn Rand um, has had a natural movie business personality, actually, although, uh, but on the good side of the, uh, of the political arena. Uh, <laughs> what happened to me was I came in on the, uh, what was supposedly the good side of the blue. I I'm, I'm not embarrassed to say because I've written about it in, in very extensively in Turning Right at Hollywood and Vine. I was very left wing when I came into this. 
a left wing in the way a lot of people of my generation were. Uh, and to, to say that we were stupid is, is the easy thing. It, it, you, it, yeah, I wasn't really stupid. I went to Ivy League schools, big deal. What, what it was is that I, I was part of the team, you know, and, and then they rewarded me for that. You know, I was a... Uh, uh, an early because I made money screenwriting very young, like 25, in, in an era of Hollywood when they threw money at you. I mean, it was kind of weird. It also made you, if somehow or other they thought you had it. And there were people who went for years making fortunes without having a movie made. Wow. But yeah, that this I don't think that happens now. But anyway, it happened then. Uh, and I was making money I didn't know what to do with it, so I became a, a financier of the Black Panther Breakfast Program. So I, no I, I now a libertarian. I knew people they, people on the so far on the other side. It's silly. I mean, I knew wow. some of the big Panthers. I knew the Chicago Seven and Tom Hayden and all those people, and and they thought I was the coolest guy around, and, and they loved my detective stories. And they, this is partly why I essentially got thrown out of Hollywood and started writing the things I do now, because the you, they look, felt there was like a sense of betrayal, was an, an apostate. Right. And, yeah, you know, apostate and that's kind of really the one thing that can't be uh, can't be forgiven. So uh, let's talk a little bit about that uh, conversion, so to speak. Um, your book, Turning Right at Hollywood and Vine, uh, the perils of coming out conservative in Tinseltown, though I understand you consider yourself more of a libertarian. Um, mm -hmm. I understand the original title was Blacklisting Myself. So let's yeah. talk a little bit about the book. Uh, and and I, one question is, are, are the common impressions that we have of Hollywood and the entertainment industry as overwhelmingly left, are, are those accurate or do you think they're overblown? I, they're relatively accurate. I mean, uh, and, and there are and there are quite a number of people, probably not so far from where you're sitting, who uh, think otherwise and shut up about it. True. Uh, in fact, you know, I, I'm not, I know of some who do, and you know that's kind of sad way to live your life. Uh, and as, for for me as a writer, it was impossible. Mm -hmm. Because I don't, I don't, I wouldn't know how to write fake stuff. I mean, I just wouldn't know how to do it. I mean, I think it would be terrible. It would give itself away in two minutes. But you know, maybe I could, but I, I wouldn't even want to try. I mean, it's, it's like, why do you want to be a writer and do that? Then go, right. go some, do something else. But so I want to, I want to get to your, to your latest book. But I, I just can't gloss over your achievement of the Moses Wine Detective series. Um, the first of which, The Big Fix, you adapted into a screenplay with uh, Richard Dreyfus as the lead. Where did you get the idea for the series? Were there elements um, from your own life experience? Oh, yeah. That, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm Moses Floyd. But, you know, they, they, I, I just put my, well, I got the idea. I was working with the folks at Rolling Stone at the time. How cool is that? In those days, it was cool. Nowadays, you look at Rolling Stone and it's like a fossil. But anyway, uh, it, the, the uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I told the guy I was in the head, you know what we want to do? We want to do a uh, an old style Raymond Chandler, except that there's a hippie boat detective. He, you know, he's got a beard. He's you know, he smokes dope, he, you know, blah, 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 all the things everybody did in 1970. So he, they said, and they said, wow. <laughs> and that's how it happened. I mean, I literally then wrote The Big Fix in six weeks. And, wow. but it didn't get made into a movie for several years. I mean, the, that's always true with movie business anyway. But the, but, uh, uh, you know, I wrote eight of them all together, although I could have written more and it would have been more successful. I just, you know, wanted to do other things. And, and, but uh, the, the character evolved as I evolved. And part of the reason that uh, Pajamas Media, PJ Media came to be was that uh, the, the last in the, uh, in the series, which was called Final Cut, 
um, I noticed that the, that the publisher, uh, which was a branch of, sign of uh, Random House, excuse me, um, wasn't very enthusiastic. I mean, at that point, you know, I had written a number of books, so you could tell you could, hard to get the publicist on the phone, all that kind of stuff. Anyway, so I thought, well, you're going to have to do something for yourself on this one. <laughs> now, author websites... I mean, I have one, but they're really boring. Who wants to go to well, with the static? Nothing. But just about then, the blog thing was happening with this guy, Glenn Reynolds, who has since become a very close friend of mine. Uh, he, also he started, in Tennessee. It, in Tennessee. He started the Instapundit. And the Instapundit was started just like a week before 9-11. And it got incredible traffic. And I said... Well, maybe I could do that, you know, and that'll promote the book. Well, that, so I started my own blog. It became very successful because I just talked honestly about my political change. And a lot of people in those days were undergoing similar kinds of things after 9-11. So that's, the book became, became very popular, but it, the book didn't sell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, it didn't, it didn't go back, but... Nevertheless, that that started me on in a whole new direction. It changed my so life. That that was a that was a political change. This was a geographic uh, and cultural, and I guess political change as oh, well. Yeah. So, uh, want to talk about American uh, refugees? And again, I want to encourage those of you who are watching, who have moved, who have a story one way or the other, maybe thinking of moving. Um, Please type your questions, and this will be a great forum to discuss them. So uh, you're among the refugees, and uh, the book is in part a chronicle of your experience leaving California for Tennessee in the pre-COVID uh, wave. So let's start with your decision to join the Great Migration. Why did you and your wife make the move in 2018? Good question. And, they, and it, it first of all, it took us... A fair amount of time. We talked about it for a long time. I mean, because it's LA, hard to leave. In some ways, it's hard to leave California. You know, it's, it's, it's hard to leave California. Time. It's it's hard to move. Period. And it's right. also, I mean, California has its obvious allures. Just sitting there in the, maybe the best part of California, Malibu. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but the uh, the other, you know, we were living in the in the Hollywood Hills. We were living in a in a uh, up near Mulholland Drive, not quite there, but you know, gradually the home the homeless started living on Mulholland, and they would be coming down. It was hard to walk the dog, but what had happened before was after I had started PJ Media, I got a uh, note in my mailbox that said, "We know where you live." My goodness! Yeah, not particularly a heartening note. Uh, I have no idea to this day who wrote it. It was just scrolled and thrown to me. But uh, I had also been, you know, I used to hang out at the farmer's market all the time uh, at a table that became fam quite famous. The BBC would film it and everything. The writers and directors would hang out there. And, I, you know, it, uh, even like fancy visiting directors like Bertolucci shows up one day or something. But it's, we, yeah, I became persona non grata. I mean, the, I could see when I would come to the people going, uh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, those are just the, the something we were looking for new horizons, and finally, finally, we decided to do it. Uh, I was pushing toward Charleston, South Carolina, where I had been several times and think it's a beautiful place. Uh, but my wife and daughter were like crazy country music fans. I like it. Uh, and they were opting for Nashville. I, I'm glad Nashville's a bigger place and the me Metro Nashville is bigger. So I think we're, we're glad that we did. For the second reason that we're glad we did that is one week after we moved, there was a big hurricane down in Charleston. <laughs> and it the places that I wanted to live, which were down by the water, were all all got uh, two feet of water in their house. Anyway, you've been so very I, yes, geographically, you've had good timing. You, you left uh, 
Malibu um, right before your house there burned down. Uh, you what, just happens? dodged the bullet of uh, the hurricane in Charleston. If I, if I leave, watch out. Follow me. Anyway. <laughs> no, well, uh, would you ever leave at this point? You know, here's the thing about movie. I'm not planning on it. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, never and ever are big words. Mm -hmm. But Moving itself, and this is for people listening who are contemplating moving, and moving's a big deal. I mean, especially if you have a household. I mean, I'm looking at all the books and that are behind your head here. Now, uh, I think I got rid of a thousand books before we moved just because, and we still got thousands more. We, you never have enough bookshelves. That's one of the things that people who like books learn quickly. But, but, uh, and, and it's not just books; it's every bit of stuff that you've got. <laughs> plus, plus, you, disrupting everything about your life, your friends, family, uh, work situations. For some people, I mean, I was fortunate because uh, being a writer, I can sort of move where where, where, where yeah. you are. Yeah, you know. But I think that that's kind of part of the the problem. I I think I feel this especially when I talk to some some young people where they say, um, I can't find a job that I like here. Or, you know, they complain about where they are. And in the past, I mean, growing up, my father was a cardiologist and, you know, yeah. young, and we were moving all the time, you know, North Carolina, then New York, then Boston, then, you know, Philadelphia, wherever. Um, and you compare the kind of rates of American in interstate migration and mobility with that of immigrants to to the to the country that you know they they they're much more willing to to make the move. And I, I think that if people didn't just feel so rooted where they were planted, uh, that they would have a lot more options. I think in the in the, in the end. And I think I make this clear in the book. Moving is good for you. It's good for your head. Uh, I, I, and the sim most simplistic analogy I can give is it's supposed to be good, and I have more trouble with this than moving, using your uh, your mouse with your left hand. Mm -hmm. is, uh, <laughs> but there's it, moving is not entirely dissimilar to that, because especially in this day and age, and, what, and one of the problems, of course, in this day and age is we all have GPS so I, to this day, I know my way around metropolitan Los Angeles better than I do here. Simply yeah. because I arrived. <laughs> you, the, you have that. You have that memory, right? Well, it's right at the light. And so, the, I mean, gradually, of course, I know it a lot of areas now, but not 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 as quickly as I could learn it without having that crutch. But that's only a minor part of it. I mean, the the other thing is that you learn people who live mostly coastal lives as i did because i was a new york la person forever is that you, you learn what america is and what americans are like and southerners of course there's something different uh although this area has become you know very there's so many people moving in that you get them from everywhere but still is uh, some of the old south here and the other thing is when i first arrived here five and a half years ago uh, the, the first big shock was people are so nice. Mm -hmm. I thought it was Rick at first. <laughs> uh, because, you know, if you lived in New York and L.A. all your life, you're not used to people normally being nice. That's Bru Well, that's, that, is, uh, that sounds like quite the, the refreshing change. So, you know, according to the most recent census data, eight states saw population declines, New York, California, Illinois, among the biggest losers. Uh, in the case of California, it seems like the population decline uh, started about a dozen years ago, but then it really took a nosedive in 2020 um, with some of the most restrictive uh, pandemic interventions in, in the country. From the California expats that you have talked to, some of who you interviewed for the book, what do you feel are the main drivers? Um, quality well, of life, uh, values, all of the above? Now you've hit the heart of the book. Because uh, previously, a lot of people down here took a stance. You can come here, but don't bring your California values with you. 
<laughs> and that was a, the classic part of it. It turned out to be the reverse. And now this is a generalization, but but nevertheless, as a generalization, it was the reverse. In other words, the people who moved here were more constitutionalist, more tending libertarian, a lot of them, than, than the people who were here. Because the people who were here were sort of lulled. <laughs> and also, as in almost all political situations, the leaders at the top are worse than the people that they're serving. And the leaders, that's true, not completely. We have decent senators, for example. But but a lot of the local government here is just god all, <laughs> And is really rhino-esque or another way of looking at it, a better way that was explained to me was that they're just the old Southern Democrats wearing new Republican clothes. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, that's common throughout the South. There's a lot of that. And yeah. there's nothing that the left would rather like than turn these states blue. And they do the, and they do that from the, from the, you know, from the bigger cities outward. And, right. Well, and of course, um, yeah, the the education and and the indoctrination that that we're seeing at these universities. Um, so that is one of the biggest misconceptions, you know, that people might be looking at these refugees from California or from New York and uh, thinking of it as a, uh, a an invasion. But but you actually use the metaphor of the cavalry <laughs> arriving. Yes. So yeah. that's that's yeah. one mis. <laughs> One misconception. What are what are some of the misconceptions that you or other refugees from blue states have had about their new homes? What what was the biggest wake up call for for, for you that you thought, oh, I didn't think it was going to be like this? Uh, I, my kids are not school age anymore, uh, but I'll get to that in a second. But the uh, uh, the general misconception that a lot of us had was that places like Nashville. Uh, were maybe purple, right? Uh, actually, they're really blue. I mean, they're blue, blue. And they're not blue like L.A. or San Francisco. I mean, <laughs> uh, they're, they're not mass robberies going on and people being let out in the streets. <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's not that. But, but you know, if you, if you listen to the Metro Ma National Council on... on closed circuit TV, which you can do, you're um, looking at a um, kind of low rent Polish bureau. <laughs> and and it, it can be funny too, if you're, if you're in the right mood, but um, it's, it's not, it's not what you, what we expected. A lot of us expected now, the, now also in terms of expectation, uh, not far from where we are is the city of Franklin, Tennessee. Now, Franklin, is sort of like a bedroom community for Nashville, but it's in Williamson County, which has, as many people think, it may still be the per capita richest Republican county in the in the country. It's where a number of country stars live. Marsha Blackburn lives there. A lot of, you know, well known people like you know that there are almost house L names live there on on to die for estates, you know, hundreds of acres with their own cattle and all kinds of stuff. And, you know, it's quite, it's a really beautiful area. But at the same time, so people were coming to, Frank and the downtown Franklin, I describe in the book as sort of um, Norman Rockwell meets sushi bars. So you can have the America that you you know, dreamed of as, you know, wholesome and beautiful. Also, you got the modern conveniences. You you got a Thai restaurant if you need one. And all the rest, right. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, uh, it's, and also was said to have a great public school system. So people are coming from all over to uh, Williamson County because it had this great public school system. Slow down. What turned out not, it turned out to have its own levels of infection including, you know, uh, it, it's been taken down now, but kids going home uh, with iPads teaching the ABCs as the gay BCs. Hmm. 
So yeah, so that was probably not yeah. not quite what uh, what what you were expecting, and and so that so some of the cultural um, challenges that it are shaking out is being driven by people that are coming in and have a certain set of expectations, and so uh, it's, I think it's probably going to continue to change politics for for years to come. So we're going to try to get to some of these audience questions. I was having such a good time with you; I didn't realize that that uh, we've already gone through half of our time together. So uh, uh, in terms of that interaction and some of the, those um, maybe unexpected conflicts. My Modern Galt uh, on Instagram asks, as a Northern Texan, Texan, housing prices have skyrocketed with this migration. Uh, what would you say to those who have a negative sentiment to the wave of people coming into their cities? Well, you know, I, I I'd be a liar to say that. I mean, the housing values have gone up here too, obviously, and I know from Texas friends it's true there. Um, this is the market in action, and the, there's little we can do about it. I, my advice to that person is stay put in your house and enjoy the fact that you, <laughs> if you have to sell it in 20 years when you're retired, you're going to get a bigger check than you got before. I mean. Mm -hmm. that, that's, I mean, otherwise, I mean, you, you know, that's or get in, or get into the housing um, and construction business, uh, as my old boss David Murdoch used to say, uh, any fool can make a fortune uh, when when there's a, a boom, and um, when you have these sort of uh, really unprecedented uh, events like these this mass migration that that we are seeing, um, people you know, can I, I, find a way to take advantage of that are going to make a lot of money. If Trump loses in the fall, the migration will only increase. That's my prediction. I, because people are going to, they're going to flee these blue, blue states. All right. Another question uh, from Xavier Collins on Facebook. Do you think these migrations are shifting things in America and making the country more split along geographic ideological lines? Oh uh, yes, <laughs> uh, you know, the, you know, people. Have to, <laughs> I have a lot of stuff in the book that I'm talking to this guy who pseudonymously named Rocky. I call him Rocky Top. He calls himself Rocky Top because he once had a blog called Rocky Top. Rocky Top is the name of a very famous bluegrass song that uh, is the Tennessee State song. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Rocky, the real Rocky Top is, I would say, I have never met anyone who knows the inside of politics better than this guy. He, advisor to, to presidential candidates in Washington and also gubernatorial candidates in Tennessee and in Nashville and the Capitol. So he knows state politics and Nashville very well. And, you know, he talked about all this stuff all the time. And, you know, we were... The whole time I was writing the book, he was very aware. He was sort of my guru for the book. And we were talking about whether, you know, speaking of your, the question that's up there on Facebook, um, what we are looking at uh, is a kind of new divided USA or scarily the potential for civil war. At least a kind of cold, uh, a civil cold war. You know, just kind of like we had an, an international Cold War. Okay, uh, our friend Liberty Shamrocker on YouTube um, is asking, Roger, now that you're in Tennessee, are you thinking everyone else stop coming? And thoughts <laughs> of moving again. Oh, Pull up the, draw strip, yeah. the drawbridge. Oh, no. First of all, it's a lot of empty land in Tennessee. So don't, don't, uh, you That's know, there's true. land in America. They, they, they like to pretend that. There isn't, but it, it, it's, um, you know, if you, I, I would say to any people who are listening to this show, I, w I would welcome to Tennessee anytime because you know what they're going to be like, and I'd like to have them as neighbors. And you have this book that you can read before you go. <laughs> um, we, we had our Galt's Gulch in, in Nashville last year, and it was absolutely delightful. Uh, it was hard to get our staff to leave and go back to their various states. Um, and uh, 
We were just talking about this before we jumped on. Uh, Grown Castri says, greetings from Argentina, the new land of freedom. So uh, uh, Grown, Roger wants to visit you, and he's, he, he may consider uh, moving Liberty if, uh, if, if things Yo don't. Yo no a Argentina. Español. <laughs> Uh, all right, Jacek Isaac Montrose on X asks, what do you think about Republican states pledging support for Texas with the immigrant crisis? Do you think the blue to red migration has helped reinforce these states? Uh, it, it, it is to, well, look, at the most, uh, it, it's quite obvious here in Tennessee, but it's even more obvious it turned Florida completely red. Uh, you know, Texas has always been in jeopardy because they just want to get Texas. The, the left is just has a lust for Texas is terrible. But uh, uh, but yes, in every case, it's helped shore up. And and it's kind of wonderful, uh, you know, since I'm an editor of Epic Times, I get to go around to all these states and I, I, I have a great time talking to the people. It's, it's it's the politicians that sometimes creep me out, but the the people who are there, America is a great place. It really is. I mean, I, I spent a lot of time in Europe, and I love America. Mm -hmm. Kiss me for me on Instagram asks, would you ever go back to writing fiction, or is politics your main focus these years? Uh, you, good, thank you for asking. I think I'm thinking very strongly of going back to fiction or screenwriting in the next year, because this, you know, I, I I'm not going to stop writing politics because I have a contract with the Epoch Times that makes me uh, deliver them a column uh, like every hour. So, so oh. I have to, not quite that bad, and, but I <clears throat> so I will be doing that. But I'm going to go back to fictional writing because, you know, it's who I am. It's in my fabric. And also, if I thought I couldn't do it anymore, I'd, I'd feel depressed. Well, and then sometimes when you are depressed with the the uh, the way things are around you or you're dissatisfied with the state of the world and, and depending on what happens uh, next year, you can either move to... Uh, Argentina, or you can create your own magical or wonderful or capitalist or constitutionalist world of your own. Uh, Ayn Rand, when she talked about writing Atlas Shrugged, part of her motivation was that she was she was lonely. She she wanted uh, the kind of world that you know she created in the Gulch, the kind of geniuses and brilliant, um, uncompromising people. Uh, that she wished that she would meet in the real world. So I, I do think that it's also part of the romance of, of the great fiction. Person. I, 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 you know, the truth of the matter is, I, I make jokes about moving to Argentina because I, I uh, think this guy Mila is an incredible person, and uh, but I'm not doing that. I, if, <laughs> I mean, if, no matter what happens, I'm staying here to fight. Zach Carter on Facebook uh, asks, looking at the state of modern films and entertainment, what would you say to young writers looking to enter the field? Because, Roger, you are still on the voting uh, for the Academy. Is that right? So you're reviewing the films? and Yes. Well, I, I don't want to be... <laughs> too discouraging. discouraging. I came into writing both fiction and film at a time it was a lot easier. I think right now, uh, and right now you you have to be an entrepreneur more. I mean, I it, when I came into it, you know, first of all, I was a liberal then, which made it easier. But 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 I was also the the world was much more open to anybody. And also, there were going concerns. Now, now the the movie business was then run by filmmakers. I mean, the, the, all those Jews from Eastern Europe loved movies, and they loved America. Uh, the these uh, these are all run by multinationals now, and the networks are awful. Uh, the publishing houses are not so great. So, it's you, I would recommend actually. It, it it's not easy, but self-publishing 
It's something right. I've, but I don't like it, but it's because I'm spoiled. Right. But a young person coming into it um, learns how to do it because self-publishing takes a lot of uh, different skills than than being published by Random House. I yeah, mean, or or navigating, you know, the politics of a publishing house or uh, the studio system. I mean, I would say, Zach, that uh, maybe the optimistic part of of what's changed because you're you're asking Roger what has changed since the time he entered um, screenwriting and entertainment, and now, well, on the positive side, one thing that's changed is. Um, the internet and social media and the democratization, demonetization, dematerialization of, of how content is distributed. I mean, that I think seizing on that is uh, what has propelled the Atlas Society to, to be in the prominent position that we're in today is because, hey, we want to do an AI animated uh, book trailer of, of Atlas Shrugged and put it out there. And we do. And now people are approaching us and wanting us to do um, full length treatments of, of various uh, types of, of content and bringing the money. So um, I think what Roger's saying is, is being entrepreneurial about it is probably the right, the right way to go. Um, all right. Uh, Candace Marina has an interesting uh, question for you, uh, Roger. Uh, she's watching us on Facebook and she asks, when do you know when it's time to move on to the next project? or career? Because Roger, you've had several different kinds yeah. of careers, right? And now we hear the news that you're actually the wonderful news um, that you might at some point return to, to fiction. So is there, is it that you get bored or is it what, you know, what is well, it? You know, when I, when I, I learned it young because when I was in Hollywood, I used to alternate very deliberately between writing novels and screenplays. Uh, so that started me off in that direction. And one of the reasons I did that is my novels were pretty well known, but they didn't get that much money. So, so but, but the Hollywood people, because they saw my name in print a lot, thought I was making a fortune from these books. So uh, they needed to pay you more. Hold on me when I come in for a meeting. Oh, well, I can always write a book, <laughs> but I really need the money of a script. But that, that way, that's a giving away a little trick that happened to me. But uh, but but it did set me up into the world of realizing you can do it. I mean, first of all, life is long. It's not short. So, I mean, if you stay healthy, I mean, I've been doing this for years and I'm healthy. So I'm going to do it for more. Uh, so, and the other thing is don't be afraid. And also, the rejection is nothing. Just it, it, it took me years to realize that because at the beginning people get rejected, get their writing rejected, get their whatever it is they're doing rejected. They they take it personally and think it's a reflection on them. It's usually not. Sometimes it might be, but usually it's not. And in the and and to even dwell on it for a second is uh, is a waste of time because it, right. it what you've just done is killed your opportunity to do something else. <laughs> you would just kill time. I mean, so I mean, my my reaction to rejection of any sort to this day, right now, is the I, a very simple four letter word: next. <laughs> well, you know, and and Roger and I were talking right before we went live about uh, some of his takeaways from Ayn Rand and The Fountainhead, which is his favorite of her novels. And of course, think of all of the rejections that uh, that Howard Rourke had to deal with and how uh, the, the rejections that he dished out, too. No, I'm not going to work on that <laughs> crummy project just for the pay um, to, to follow his original vision. So, you know, might be a good time to brush up on, on the fountainhead to fortify your inner yeah, fortress. Uh, uh, right in the fountainhead. I mean, just move on and don't even think about it if someone rejects you because I mean, and I, I, I'll give a little gloss on it. And that is there might be some useful information in that. But only look at it that way. Do not look at it personally. Look at it factually. Right. Oh, the fifth chapter wasn't good. Oh, look at that. Next. Yeah, <laughs> then, no, exactly. 
I think that's important because I, I think that, uh, you know, again, looking back at Ayn Rand and um, her career and her trajectory as an artist in dealing with rejection, remember the Fountainhead was rejected 12 times before it was published. Um, but then also, you know, all of the, the criticism that she received and, uh, I think now, again, this is just my personal opinion, but at some point that the ability to shut out that criticism and to just concentrate on the tightrope ahead of her and to get the work done, that was a strength. But at some point, if that becomes your default and you're not open to hearing criticism or getting feedback, you know, you're into that vision of the anointed and not being able to uh, hear, you know, a helpful voice that says, watch out, that step's going to, you know, make you fall. Then that is is, is not a good thing either. Yeah, there's a balance to it. I mean, Ned Tannen, who was running Universal when I was there, yeah, had a thing that he used to bring people. If, if one person says, you're drunk, ignore them. If six people tell you you're drunk, sit down. <laughs> uh, all right. Georgia Alexopoulos on Facebook. What has life been like since you left PJ Media and joined the Epic Times? Sounds like it's been a lot of travel and quite busy and productive. Yeah, well, that's the busy part is absolutely true. The Epic Times, uh, I left PJ Media because it was sold. I ran it. And if you ran, if you run something, and then it sold out from under you. You don't want to stay there because uh, you, you've lost authority and it's not going to be fun. <clears throat> the Epic Times made me an offer. I sort of suspected something was true that just turned out to be true. The Epic Times is everything I wanted PJ Media to be. It is the best newspaper of our times. It has now become... Uh, the number four in subscriptions in America, just behind the Wall uh, Washington Post, is about to pass it. The only ones with more subscribers are the New York Times. That's frightening, art, awful. <laughs> American and, yeah. <laughs> and and the Wall Street Journal. But so it's really it's a quite a remarkable place, and the fact that it was started by refugees from communist China uh, is a quite interesting thing. And it's attracted a lot of talent, including talent that's appeared previously on this show, like our friend Jeffrey Tucker. Um, yeah. Okay. Tamara Cordiero on Facebook asks, have you kept up with Hollywood after leaving? Do you watch the Oscars or Golden Globes? I don't watch the Golden Globes. Never did. <laughs> the reason I don't watch the Golden Globes is, is partly personal. When uh, I wrote Enemies of Love Story, which got a fair amount of Academy Award nominations and everything else. He got nothing from the Golden Globes. And the reason is that Angelica Houston, who started it, uh, so hated the Golden Globes. <laughs> she wouldn't do what they wanted her to do those days and have lunch with them. Therefore, they got no nominations. Therefore, I never watched the Golden Globes. They're kind of stupid. But I, I, I don't watch the Academy Awards that much, but I do vote in them. And uh, I've just watched all uh, all the best pictures finally, and I just w watched one that I thought was quite quite uh, amazing that the people haven't been talking about called Past Lives. And so I'm going to put that on my list. So in about the twelve remaining minutes, I, I just have a couple more questions about your your book uh, that that I'd like to get to. Um, as you mentioned, you are communing uh, and sharing insights from a myster mysterious wise sage, Rocky Top, um, who has his own reasons for wanting to stay anonymous. One of his most disturbing insights was that, quote, the normally passive right looking to create, uh, that the left will continue to intensify their push to punish the, the normally passive right uh, looking to create incidents they can use as an excuse to ramp up the authoritarian push. Um, this echoed the theory of another recent guest on this show, Andy Bernstein, um, that he sort of saw the harassment as intentional, seeking to provoke victims into anger and violence, which can, again, provide a pretext for authoritarian control. Do you agree with that? Uh, and if so, what are some examples? 
Well, I don't have any ready examples on that because I, I but I, I, I agree with it. I, I, I sense it. Uh, I, you know, I, I vacillate on how much of this stuff is planned against us or how much of it just happens. Mm -hmm. and I, I think it's a combination, actually. But, uh, you know, I, one part of my book that I'd like to bring in yeah. is, um, is the one of the last chapters in the book is called steeples yes yeah and one of the most amazing things that happened to me from moving having lived all my life in new york and los angeles i was not a religious person i mean i yeah i'm jewish i went to occasionally i would go to passover I did, you know i did, did things that most casual jews did but i didn't do anything I didn't think about it much. And and I uh, <clears throat> arrived in Nashville and there were steeples all over the place. And I started to realize that everybody went to church and the Jews actually all went to synagogue. And I said it started to affect me in a strange way because I noticed that also it had to do with how people took care of each other and how nice they were. And I said, now I've joined up with Havad in, in Nashville, and uh, I, I'm feeling much better because of it. Not just feeling better. I think the world is better when it's like that. Uh, that, that you know, uh, we can be as libertarian or objectivist as we want, and I think that's good. I'm 100% for it. But I think the other aspect of it actually fits in. And uh, I, you know, they feed each other. And I think one of the interesting things about moving for people who've been living in, 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 in the coastal world, in Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, Bo well, Boston's a little different maybe, but those cities, uh, they would spiritually profit. I hate to say this because I'm the least spiritual guy if you're looking at my life. <laughs> because, uh, they, would they would profit spiritually by moving. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, as an objectivist, I'm I'm an atheist, but as I was telling you, I do often go to Chabad. And I think what I took away from the book, whether it was that chapter or talking about, you know, your new tennis partners or talking about uh, the, the gentlemen's groups that that you've come across was was friendships and communities and whether, you know, whether you're a atheist or agnostic or religious or spiritual, um, that finding a place where you can commune with people who share common values. And that's certainly something that it sounds like you've been able to do um, mm -hmm. with, with your, your move. Uh, now I did, we didn't spend a lot of time talk. We've talked about Tennessee. Um, we've talked about some of the other people that have uh, made the move there. Uh, we we didn't talk a lot about uh, Texas or or Florida, but in the conversations that you include in the book and and that you've had with others, um, what about people that are considering moving to one of these other states, well, or I, even I, just to you know like uh, Colorado? I mean, sometimes maybe they they're not going to. Uh, I would not advise if you're trying to avoid a blue state. <laughs> I think we've gotten a lot of Colorado lately. I, I would investigate Idaho and Montana and places like that. Uh, Ixnay on Colorado. And the, the problem with Georgia, Georgia is fascinating, actually. But Georgia, because I spent a lot of time in Georgia. And some of the, and there, one of the unknown stories about this book that I, a little bit I can say is that three pages had to be excised for legal reasons. So the book was printed twice. And, yeah, no, it was a very heart-wrenching uh, experience for me. Uh, the, I can assure you the three pages were accurate. <laughs> uh, it, we live in a day and age when people get sued for things that are true all the time. And anyway, uh, especially by companies and people with fat pockets. But the, but uh, some of that had to do with Georgia. And what uh -huh. I discovered in Georgia is that um, it's a place with a lot of great people, a lot of great people. 
but both on the left and at the and in the at the high end of the right in the in the office owners. Whoa, <laughs> beware, <laughs> beware. Okay. It's, Interesting. I mean, it's a very interesting, complicated place. Uh, I mean, Atlanta has most of the bad aspects of Los Angeles with a few of the good ones. Savannah is a different thing because it's, you know, you, you, well, you can go read about it in the, uh, the Lights of Good and Evil and all that. <laughs> it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's a very romantic place. So that that's, if I lived in Georgia, I'd go to Savannah, but uh, it's not. There's a lot of it's. It's interesting how parts of the country evolve. And the other thing people do is, is you should read your, your southern fiction because it tells you a lot. Robert Penn Warren, fantastic. Harper Lee, fantastic. Um. So, what about those? I, I've seen some people who claim to represent. Uh, the liberty movement in some aspect or another who say that the blue parts of red states are the parts that give them culture, the parts that make them interesting are the places that have the symphony and the ballet and the museums. True to some extent, but not completely true because if you, you know, the thing about Tennessee is country music is pretty great. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you go to a bluegrass festival, you get your head blown off by the level of musicianship. And that didn't all happen right in the downtown Nashville. I had it up in the hills. Uh, There was that documentary that was done on PBS about the history of country music a couple of years ago. You know, that famous documentarian, his name is, did it. It was great. And it showed most of it, most of that music came out of rural areas. And it's beautiful. So you, if you, on the snob sense, and I, I don't mean that negatively. I mean, yes, I, I like going to some of these. I like museums. Uh, and yes, they're in the big cities. <laughs> All right. Mm-hmm. Uh, unless All you right. can, unless you consider distilleries museums. Which, <laughs> uh, I, there's, there's an, an argument to be made for that. We had our final uh afternoon of our um, Gwalt Sculpt in Nashville at a wonderful, huge uh, distillery. I can't remember the name of it, but it was, we had a blast. So in the minute or so that we have left, Roger, is there anything that I didn't ask you about in terms of your book or any any other subject that I, I didn't get to touch on? Uh, you know, everyone always does that to me in an interview, and I always, <laughs> always feel yeah. up. I, I yeah, I, I I actually I I usually uh, never do, but I feel like I've um, uh, kind of dominated this conversation. And and your book is very rich, and there there are a lot of um, aspects to it. But uh, we're, so, what are the best ways for us to follow you, particularly as there's going to be some of us who will be waiting with bated breath breath to see your return to fiction, Twitter oh. or. Uh, Epoch Times or a blog, to some degree, like fiction, and uh, not that it's fictional, but I the it's style full of stories. Of, it's full of stories. It's the style of a fiction writer, not a, and I and that's and that's part of my uh, I I need to entertain people. I uh, this, mm-hmm. this <laughs> I, I you know I, I have to have at least one joke every three pages. <laughs> well, uh, this has certainly been uh, more than entertaining. So thank you, Roger. Thank you very, very much. And uh, congratulations on your magnificent accomplishment. Folks, go out and buy American refugees. And thanks to all of you who joined us uh, for this hour. Thanks for all of the great questions um, from our regulars. And I saw some new faces as well. Uh, As always, I'm going to put it to you if you enjoyed this program. If you're not already donating to the Atlas Society, guys, we are a nonprofit. Start your 2024 off right with a tax deductible donation of any amount to the Atlas Society. And be sure to join us next week when author Jan Heike joins the Atlas Society to discuss his latest book, Out of the Melting Pot, Into the Fire, Multiculturalism in the World's Past and America's Future. We'll see you then.